so uh, the guys are to, uh, enthusiastic and fantastic. Uh, well, the last organist will call Spring Break. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Grant Brown. So he's uh, actually Associate Dean at uh, Concordia, which I'm sure he will complain about um, <laughs> at length over a beer afterwards. So, if, uh, so we're going to go to Thompson House afterwards, so if anyone else if anyone has uh, questions that you don't get addressed here, I'm sure that people will need to chat to us. So he, um, he has a kind of, he's very well known in the field of fish biology and, uh, and behavioural ecology. He did his PhD at Memorial, then postdocs at uh, Saskatchewan and Mount Allison, uh, and where he's working with Jean-Luc Godin, they know well known to uh, graphic biologist. Then he was in New York for an assistant professorship before moving on to the University of Concordia in 2001 where he's kind of progressed through the ranks, and now he's a full professor um, there. So he's published over 120 papers in, the, in, uh, in this field, and he'll be telling us about his work on, on the EFOBIA today. So I'll let you All right. get on with it. Well, thank, thank you. you. And uh, you must remember to turn the clock on so I know how fast or slow to go. Uh, first, let me thank Simon and Will for extending the opportunity to come up here, down here, up here. Uh, geography, right? Uh, come up to McGill and tell you about some of our recent work looking at neophobia as a possible mechanism by which prey populations can respond to variable and unpredictable or uncertain uh, predation threats. Now, by way of introduction, this shouldn't be news to you, but that should say anti-predator behavior is costly, right? and anti-predator behavior is I hope it's not going to be a fill-in-the-blank kind of talk. <laughs> it works on the screen. Um, you can all gather around the laptop. Uh, Antipredator behavior is costly. And it's costly in terms of uh, time and energy being spent being vigilant and avoiding predators, and time and energy lost to other fitness-related activities, such as foraging, courting, mating, and territorial defense. So selection should favor individuals that can reliably assess local predation threats and adjust their level or intensity of anti-predator response according to the level of perceived risk. And the arguments have made that uh, by doing this, they can balance the trade-offs between the benefits of predator avoidance on one hand <coughs> and other fitness-related uh, behaviors on the other hand. Now, there's a large number of models in the literature that talk about this over varying time scales. We have the risk allocation model, the asset protection model, the threat-sensitive predator avoidance hypothesis, but all of these models <coughs> excuse me, make the implicit assumption that prey can reliably assess local predation threats. Right. And what that means is they're assuming that prey are able to not only recognize what is a predation threat, but equally important, they can recognize what is not a predation threat. Now, the ability to recognize predators is becoming more abundantly clear that this is difficult under conditions a variable or uncertain predation risk. And predation risk can be variable for a number of reasons. It can vary spatially and temporally with as prey and predators move in and out of microhabitats. You can have increased diversity of predator guilds with different foraging tactics. And we can have ontogenetic shifts in risk. What's a predation risk on Monday may not be a predation risk on Friday. Right? Short-term growth. Uh, you can leave a the risk of one predator and grow into the risk of another predator. So there can be highly variable predation risk. So the question then becomes, how do prey recognize potential predators? How do they recognize what is a predator? <coughs> and as soon as we ask that question, we usually fall into the old dichotomy of learned versus innate or genetically fixed predation risk. Right? Now, at one extreme, we can make the argument that learning is beneficial. Learning to recognize what is a predator through direct or indirect experience should be beneficial under conditions of variable predation risk. Right? <clears throat> it's beneficial because it allows for flexible behavioral responses. Prey can respond to changes in predation risk. And as Moat Ferrari, who I believe spoke this past fall, she told you, and I won't go into any great detail, but, try to, oh, there it works. This learning, learning to recognize uh, predator identity is highly context-specific, can give rise to threat-sensitive behavioral trade-offs, as well as the memory window or the adaptive forgetting aspect, right? So how long to retain learned information can all contribute to give plastic behavioral responses to variable predation threats. Hopefully, resulting in the ability of prey to respond to ecologically relevant threats 
and avoid wasting time and energy responding to things that actually aren't threatening. Of course, there's costs associated with learning. In addition to the uh, newly described physiological costs associated with learning and cognitive abilities, there's a more direct cost in that prey must survive that initial encounter with the predator in order to acquire information. Okay? Now, at the other extreme, we can have an innate or genetically fixed, depending on the terminology you want to use, and we would predict or expect these innate recognition mechanisms to be beneficial under conditions of relatively stable predation pressure, when you have certain predator, uh, relatively certain uh, predation risk. So high risk or intense risk from relatively few predator types, or uh, an extremely low probability of surviving the initial encounter with the predator. These can result in the recognition and avoidance of predators independent of experience. I'll do this a lot because apparently my laser pointer doesn't want to work. So this is independent of, of, of experience. So we can get a fixed response that should, in theory, reduce the overall risk of predation for individuals, eliminate the cost of learning so it's beneficial, and uh, under conditions of, of very high predation pressure, it should be, uh, it should be a, a good thing. Problem is, there's costs associated with this as well. <clears throat> the main cost that we're concerned with is the reduced flexibility behavioral plasticity to respond to variations in predation threats. New predators enter the habitat, individuals are unable to respond to that. The other potential cost is that if you're spending all your time avoiding things that you recognize as risks, if they are risks, great. If they're not risks, you're wasting time and energy that could be spent on other uh, activities such as foraging. Okay? So the question becomes, because right? rarely do we see these, these isolated habitats that are variable but relatively low risk, learning, extremely high and stable. What we usually see, a high risk from a diversity of predators. So the question becomes, how can prey maintain flexible behavior patterns and reduce the overall cost associated with predator recognition learning? Well, as a starting point, we can step back away from fish and look at the bird literature. Right? People like Lynn Snedden and Russell Greenberg have talked at great length about neophobia in, in the context of foraging, exploration, and, and, and uh, habitat use. And they argue that neophobia, which uh, <clears throat> can be defined or described as an avoidance or an elevated vigilance when individuals are faced with novel habitats, novel social contexts, or novel food items. And that definition is taken from Lynn Snedden's 2003 review paper. Now, Greenberg argues that there's going to be intrinsic variation, what he calls intrinsic variation between species. In other words, some species are more or less neophobic than others. But he also described considerable intraspecific variation, where you get variation in neophobia between populations and within populations of the same species. And one of the mechanisms he talked about that would allow for this kind of uh, within, within species uh, variability is what he termed the dangerous niche hypothesis, in which R very generally argues that the cost of living associated with using a local habitat in terms of foraging competition, finding suitable food, the temporal and spatial variability of foraging opportunities, uh, as that increases, that should increase the cost, the, the risk of an individual making an inappropriate or what he termed a wrong decision. So this dangerous niche argument in the context of foraging makes the argument that as the cost of living increases, uncertainty in sh should increase, and what Greenberg called caution should increase. Birds should become more cautious, more neophobia, more neophobic rather. So we can, we can <clears throat> take from that that uncertainty is going to drive neophobia in this context, and he also made the argument that neophobia should interact with individual experience. Right. There's high cost of living, but through experience they learn, yeah, my food will be over there. It's actually not that costly. But we need to ask ourselves, what about the application of this neophobia to predator recognition? And when you look at the avian literature, you find one study with juvenile turkeys. And that's not my photo. I didn't put the proper credit up on somebody else's photo. Uh, juvenile turkeys reared in, uh, <clears throat> with high variability in foraging opportunity do tend to show uh, more avoidance of a novel predator model 
than do uh, turkeys, juvenile turkeys reared in, you know, very stable environments. But that's not a, uh, a very strong uh, conclusion. There are problems with that experiment. But the point is, that's the only one. So what I want to tell you about today, ooh, uh, already late. Uh, what I want to tell you about today is how can we take these ideas and apply them to questions of predator recognition to try and understand how prey respond to uncertainty and predation risk. Well, we can propose a model, and we've done this model uh, in a uh, chapter in a wonderful book, I'll give a plug by Colin Brown and uh, Kevin Lalonde, Jens Krauss, called Fish Cognition and Behavior. Good bedtime reading. Uh, we have a chapter there in a recent proceedings paper in which we argue that neophobic predator recognition, if this system exists, we can make a number of predictions. The first prediction we can make is that neophobia should, be pres should vary between populations. Populations that are exposed to high or variable predation risk should show a higher propensity for neophobia. We can also predict that neophobia should be inducible or phenotypically plastic. There's costs associated to responding to things that are not a risk. So we should only see neopho neophobia in populations that are exposed to elevated risk. We can make the prediction that the response intensity of novel cues should match the background level of risk. Right? The, uh, <coughs> if the ambient risk, ambient predation risk, recent experience is driving uh, the response to novel cues, novel potential predator cues, then the intensity of that response should match the level of risk. We'd expect a high, high intensity response at high risk conditions and low intensity at low risk. We might also predict that the information available through these novel cues, novel predator cues, should be qualitatively different from known cues. And what do I mean by known cues? Known cues are the alarm cues, the alarm substance, the damage release cues, what we used to call alarm pheromones. Right? If you take a guppy, a cichlid, and you take the, a skin extract and you expose fish to that, they will show a dramatic short-term increase in, in anti-predator behavior. And they do this because there's been very strong selection pressure acting on the signal receivers. The presence of the odor of an injured conspecific is an honest, reliable, honest and reliable signal of immediate predation risk. That same fish detecting a novel cue doesn't know if it's an honest or reliable indicator. So we might expect the response to a known versus these novel cues to be qualitatively different as well as quantitatively different. And finally, we can make the prediction that neophobia should interact with learning and that experience should shape the subsequent responses. So our model predicts that under high variable risk conditions, prey should show initial neophobic response. And based on the behavioral outcome, right, I detect this cue, I show a response, but there's actually no predator present. Then the next exposure to that cue should be of lower intensity. If in effect, prey are learning that it's not risky. Whereas if they detect that cue and they detect a predator, a reliable prediction cue, it should be reinforced and strengthened. Okay. So we'd expect this interaction with learning. So the question, does it vary between populations? Well, the first set of data I'll tell you about very quickly is we can take guppies from the upper Repo River and the lower Repo River. Right? The upper is a classic low predation site the lower repo is a high predation site. We take the guppies back to the lab and then we expose them to varying chemical cues. And we can take a guppy alarm cue, which again we know will elicit an increase in anti predator response. We give it that or a distilled water uh, control. And that is paired with tilapia odor. Why tilapia? Well, tilapia are introduced to Trinidad as an aquaculture fish, they exist in, in freshwater ponds. They're not in the streams. So this is a potential predator of the guppy that the guppies have never detected before. Okay, so it's a novel cue. So we take the odor of the tilapia or distilled water, and we take a couple measures of uh, <coughs> standardized measures of an anti-predator response. And we see that, yes, guppies do show a response to the novel chemical cue. So if we look at shoaling index, an increase means they're shoaling more cohesively together. Right? The red are our high predation fish. And if we give them water, water as our double control, they're not different. Uh, they don't differ from the upper repo fish. 
If we give them water and tilapia odor, we show a significant increase in shoaling and reduction in, in area use, indicating an anti-predator response, whereas those from the low predation site don't respond. There's no change in shoaling, and if anything, there's an increase in area use. When we go over here with alarm cue, we give them alarm cue alone, and we get strong anti-predator responses in both populations. And when we give alarm cue and tilapia, that's our highest risk cue, right? we get no increase in intensity of response in our low predation fish, but what looks like a possible additive, additive effect in our high predation fish. So these data tell us, yes, high predation fish are showing a response to a chemical cue that they've never detected before, they've never interacted with before. Well, this is a lab study. Do we get the same results in the field? Well, we can use predator inspection behavior as a, a tool to assess, uh, ask the question, how risky do you think this chemical cue is? So we can take a model predator, and it's suspended on a, uh, <coughs> excuse me, on a fishing line. Um, here's our lovely model predator. And if you look very closely, uh, you can see a guppy coming in to inspect that model. Now, we can pair this visual cue with a, just an airline tube tied to a rock, which will high-tech science. And we can introduce varying chemical cues. So we give it uh, the visual cue plus a guppy alarm cue, a known high risk. We can give it guppies, uh, the visual cue rather, paired with stream water, a low risk cue. We've done this before. We know how they should respond to these two. But then we can pair that with crinocichlid odor, which is a natural predator in two of our three populations, with tilapia odor, which is novel in all three, or lemon oil. Right? McCormick's lemon oil purchased at the local metro right, as a completely ecologically irrelevant cue that they've never run into. And we can measure per capita rate of inspection, inspecting group size, uh, several other measures as well. I'll just show you these two. And if we look over here at our high-risk population, right, the visual predator plus the alarm cue is a low inspection rate, significantly lower than stream water. More importantly, however, is the crenocyclid odor, the tilapia odor, and lemon oil are all treated as high risk, same as the alarm cue. So they're showing a novelty response here. In the low predation site over here, we get alarm cues significantly lower than stream water, so they're responding. Right? But curiously, and you can ask Chris Selvage about this, uh, when you inject the novel cue with the visual predator, they inspect at such a ridiculously high rate that we just have to hold up our hands and say, yeah, they inspect a lot. We can't count them. They're inspecting so much. Right? So we can also look at inspecting group size, and we get the same pattern, where, again, they're treating all cues as risky relative to stream water under high predation conditions. They're treating them not risky relative to the alarm cue in the low predation risk and intermediate in the intermediate predation risk population. So the lab and the field data suggest that guppies from high predation sites do indeed show a response to a novel chemosensory cue. Right? Can we induce this? Is it a phenotypically plastic response? Well, the way we went about this <coughs> excuse me, is we took uh, convict cichlids from our lab population or uh, wood frog tadpoles from a uh, natural population. We collected them and we exposed them to high risk versus low risk. So cichlids were exposed to cichlid alarm cue, tadpoles to ground up tadpoles, or uh, distilled water. And we did that twice a day for seven days. And then one day later, we tested the cichlids for their response to rainbow trout odor as a completely novel cue. And the tadpoles were tested to tiger salamanders, which we know are absent in the, the population which they were collected. And it's kind of hard to see here, I apologize, but if they were on the distilled water treatment, the low risk treatment for a week, there's absolutely no difference between distilled water and trout or distilled water and salamander for cichlids and tadpoles. But if they had that high risk treatment uh, for a week, we gave them either of the double cues, we get a significant reduction in time movement in cichlids and a significant reduction in the number of lines crossed in tadpoles. So yes, we can induce this uh, neophobic response in uh, uh, a lab population or a low-risk natural population. 
Now, we can extend this and ask the question, are there life history phases uh, at which prey individuals should be more or less uh, vulnerable to inducing neophobia? The argument here is that if you are at a young, early life history phase stage, everything can eat you. So you should be very sensitive to background variation in, in ambient risk. Whereas if you're larger and older, maybe less so. Right. So we can take convict cichlids from our lab population, and we can take an egg mass, and you can, they, you can barely see there's some eggs up here. Uh, we remove the parents as soon as the eggs are fertilized, and then we start dosing them for a week with a high risk or a low risk treatment. Right. The eggs hatch out in about 72 hours, so half of that week they're being exposed as eggs, the other half they're being exposed as wrigglers. The problem with cichlids is once they hatch out, they're too small to test. So we fed them for three weeks on a very high protein diet and fed them until they almost burst. And at about three weeks, they were a testable size. And then we test them in pairs for distilled water versus trout odor. And what we see, the ones that were exposed to the, the uh, uh, distilled water uh, low risk conditioning in green, they're not different between distilled water or trout odor. But if they were exposed to the high risk treatment, we get that nice inducible pattern. Okay. Let's repeat this experiment, but now we're going to do it with juveniles. We're going to expose them as 10 to 12 millimeter juveniles. All right. We do that same treatment, and we test for their response either one day after we terminate this pre-exposure, or 21 days, three weeks. Why? Because with the regulars, we had to wait three weeks. So we'll use the same three-week delay. And when we test them one day after, we get that same pattern. If they had the high-risk pre-exposure treatment, we have a nice response to a novel predator cue. And if they had the low-risk treatment, nothing. When we, the group that we tested three weeks after, right, uh, we get that same pattern, though the results are not statistically significant. And this is a large sample size. This is uh, 20 pairs of cichlids in each treatment combination. So it seems like we can elicit some change, but it's not statistically significant, and it's much less than on the day one. So they, we can induce it, but it doesn't seem to last as long. We can take subadults, right? 45 to 55 millimeter cichlids, same population, expose them to the same levels of risk for the same time, and we initially tested them. We we're going to test them on day one and day 21, but the day one data look like that. We can't induce, using this standard protocol, we cannot induce a neophobic response to these. So we didn't bother testing them on day 21. All right? So yes, it's inducible. Okay? So that takes us to the next question. <clears throat> I can slow down. A the next question. Uh, is does the response intensity actually match the background level of risk, right? And what we're really asking here is do we get a threat sensitive response curve, right? So these are previous data, this is cichlid data from uh, 2006 and cichlid data from 2009. And what we see here is we take uh, pairs of cichlids and expose them to differing concentrations of a conspecific alarm cue. As you increase the concentration going from left to right, we get a proportional graded increase in the intensity of the response, threat sensitive response pattern. That's for an alarm cue, a disturbance cue, which is nothing more than the metabolic byproduct released by stressed or disturbed fish. So we can disturb some cichlids in a holding tank and then use that cue. Again, high relative concentrations decreasing on this figure from left to right. And with disturbance cues, we get a nice proportional graded response. These are both known cues. Right? Selection pressure is acting on the receiver of either of these cues as an honest, reliable indicator of risk. Right? Are the responses to the novel cue threat sensitive? Well, we can expose them to the cichlids again, high risk, low risk, for that same uh, procedure. But now we're going to test them to a large dose of trout odor, a high risk and intermediate uh, dose uh, of trout odor, a very low dose or distilled water control. And what we find is if they were on the alarm cue, the high risk uh, pretreatment phase, there's absolutely no effect of stimulus concentration. 
They respond the same intensity to a high risk, a high concentration, intermediate or low risk, but they all do significantly differ from the response to distilled water. And of course, there's no change in behavior if they respond if they were pre-exposed to distilled water. So no, it's not a threat-sensitive response. Right? But what we can do is we can repeat this experiment, but now instead of giving them different doses of trout odor, the novel cue, let's vary the relative intensity of the background levels of risk. So we expose them to a high risk for seven days, an intermediate risk, and a low risk for seven days, and then repeat that experiment, but now we're going to test their response to a standard dose of trout odor or distilled water, and what we find is that yes, we do get a proportional relationship where those that had the high background level of risk showed a strong response to trout odor, those that had the intermediate level showed an intermediate response, and those that had no risk didn't differ from the distilled water control. <coughs> so these data suggest that it's not threat sensitive in the way known cues are, but it is threat sensitive in that it matches the intensity of response does match the background level of risk that the prey are exposed to. Okay, <coughs> okay bear with me. This one's going to take a little, a little description. We can ask the question, <coughs> does information uh, qualitatively differ depending on the Q type? Okay. <coughs> I put this figure up just to show you that those proportional threat sensitive responses that we see in cichlids, we also see in, in guppies, though it is uh, context, uh, population specific. But if we look at the red bars, here's guppies responding to a high concentration of alarm cue. And as you decrease the concentration of alarm cue, you get a significant reduction in the intensity of the response, okay, for a high predation population. <coughs> Excuse me. So we know, as I mentioned, damage release alarm cues are subject to strong selection pressure. Good, right? Novel cues, because it's, as I just showed you, it's shaped by the background level of risk, it should be inherently a less reliable source of information. It lacks that strong association as a reliable indicator of risk, okay? So we know that perception of risk should influence the response intensity, okay? Point one. Point two is, we also know that personality, okay, behavioral syndromes, risk-taking tactics, whatever we want to call it, coping strategies, uh, there's about 47 names for this. But basically, personality should shape the perception of risk. Bold individuals should show less intense responses than shy individuals to a standardized predator cue. Okay? So we can ask the question, does information content influence the use of known, versus novel chemical cues if we take individual personality or individual risk-taking tactics into effect, into account, okay? So this experiment, don't look at the data yet. So this experiment, what we do, here's a lovely little stream enclosure. It's about 60 by 30 by 30 plexiglass enclosure. We have a small opaque box. We put a female guppy, catch it, put the female into this, allow it to acclimate, open a door remotely, and record the latency to escape as a proxy for personality. Short escape times, risk taking, risk prone, right? Bold, long escape times, shy, risk averse. And then uh, here is uh, Dr. Elvidge sitting on a bucket uh, for hours at end, staring at guppies. Uh, he once told me at the completion of the second data slide, I'll show you, that's it, I'm never doing this again, <laughs> right? <laughs> It's just not fun sitting on buckets for hours at a time, okay? So what we can do, we measure the latency. We, after they escape, we expose them to a high risk, a low risk, or stream water control, and quantify their behavior using this personality as a, as a covariate. And what we see <clears throat> is that we have change in time movement, latency to resume foraging and foraging attempts here uh, with uh, personality, bold over on the left, shy on the right. And this fine dotted line is the response to stream water. They're simply not responding, right? And it's flat, right? Bold don't respond the same way as shy don't respond. This is one way to look at that. If you give them a low concentration of alarm cue, they show a significant increase in anti-predator behavior, 
they're moving less, they're taking longer to uh, resume foraging, and they forage at lower rates. That's significantly different. But there's no effect. So bold respond to low concentrations the same way as shy fish do. But when we give them a high concentration of alarm cue, we see a very different pattern. Right? Bold fish seem to underestimate the risk associated with high cues. And we can talk about why this might be later on. Um, but shy fish show a very strong response. And we get that pattern in movement, in latency to resume foraging, and the absolute uh, number of foraging attempts. So personality is shaping the response, but only to very high risk cues. These are known cues. Let's repeat that experiment, but now we're going to use water, high risk alarm cues, or a novel chemical cue, a uh, tilapia odor. And what we see is that the response, the overall intensity of the response to the tilapia odor, is this large dashed line, if you compare the means, the means are not different from the high intensity cue, but the, the effect of personality is very different. What we find is that bold fish to the known cue are underestimating risk. Bold fish to the unknown cue are overestimating risk. So there's, we can take from this the suggestion that maybe there's less information available through these unknown, these novel cues. We're getting this lovely neophobic response, but the pattern is very different. All right? <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, so we've seen that we can, it varies between populations, we can induce it by exposure to elevated background levels of risk, it matches background levels of risk, not the concentration or the quantity of the cue detected, information does appear to be different, the amount or the form of public information is different. Now I want to tell you about a couple of experiments that look at the effects of neophobia interacting with learning. Okay? Um, <clears throat> remember the prediction is that the benefit of being neophobic under uncertain or variable predation risk is you can reduce the cost associated with that initial exposure right? and then based on the behavioral outcome, whether it is or is not associated with risk, they can modulate the response for the second, the third, the fourth, and so on exposures. Okay? Experience should shape subsequent responses, is the prediction. So in this experiment, <clears throat> we can again go out and collect guppies from the upper repo, our low predation site, and the lower repo, our very high predation site, and we're going to bring them back to the lab, and we're going to test them in shoals. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we're going to condition them to recognize, to reinforce tilapia odor as a risky cue, or pseudo condition them, right? Blank condition. So we give them an alarm cue, which we know they'll respond to. We pair that with tilapia odor, or we give them distilled water, which they don't respond to, and tilapia odor. And then we come back and we repeat test them to either distilled water as a control or tilapia odor, right? Uh, in a repeated measures design for six subsequent, uh, six sequential exposures separated by at least two hours. Okay? And again, here's our tilapia. What we find <clears throat> is these are our lower repo, our high predation fish, and the faint gray lines are the response to distilled water, and yay, they don't respond to distilled water regardless of their conditioning treatment, so I put those in gray so you don't focus on those. But what we see in green are our pseudo condition, the distilled water conditioning, and our red are our conditioned fish, those that we reinforced. Right? Now, unlike the previous experiments, just to be clear, the previous experiments, we just gave them risk or no risk for a week right, to elevate risk. Here, we're giving them an alarm cue paired with the tilapia odor one time. Okay? One time, that's all it takes. Oops. And what we see <clears throat> is that if they did, were not conditioned, we get a strong response to tilapia odor the first time right, they're tested against it, but very quickly it drops. So the second exposure decreases, and by the third exposure it's no different from our distilled water controls. If, on the other hand, we conditioned it, right, we see a strong response that persists for five to six exposures. 
and then it disappears, starts to drop off. Okay? So, yes, we can condition them, and yes, in the absence of conditioning, neophobic response uh, wanes very rapidly. All right? If we look at the low predation population, the upper repo fish, we see a very different pattern. So if they were not conditioned, it is still water control, give them tilapia order, there's absolutely no response. High predation fish did show a response. When we condition them, we get a strong response, but in the absence of subsequent uh, uh, reinforcers, that response drops off quite rapidly. And after three to four exposures, it is no different from our pseudo-conditioned controls. And if we compare, just visually compare, this line to this line, we see that the low predation fish, the response to a novel cue, even though it's conditioned, decays considerably faster than in our high predation fish. Okay. So these data do indeed suggest <coughs> that uh, the response to neophobia is either being reinforced positively or negatively upon subsequent exposures, suggesting that interaction between direct experience and uh, background levels of risk. All right. Interestingly enough, um, I was just sent a data set with wood, wood frog tadpoles showing the same experiment, or it's very similar experimental design by my collaborators, and tadpoles do almost exactly the same thing. So, yay. <laughs> All right. One last set of data I'll tell you about. <clears throat> if you go back and we look at this decay, right? This decay in the response, that loss of response could be due to ah, the guppies are learning that this is not actually risky, or it could be they're being sequentially exposed to it. So this could be a, simply a process of habituation. Right? One's interesting, the other's not so interesting. Right? Habituation, not, not a terribly interesting finding. So let's take upper repo fish, low predation risk guppies, take them back into the lab, and we'll do that cichlid-like experiment. We'll give them high risk or low risk, but this time we're going to give it three times a day for two days. Okay? <clears throat> Unlike doing work in my lab at Concordia, lab in Trinidad costs money, so you want to get the experiments done as fast as possible. So we're going to condition them to elevated or ambient risk, and we're going to test them using that same repeated measures design we use for the learning experiment. And Exposures one to five, we're going to give them the odor of tilapia. And on the sixth exposure, we're going to change things up. We're going to give them that lemon extract as a completely novel cue. <clears throat> and what we see is if we look at change in Scholli index and change in air use, those that have the low risk uh, pre exposure treatment, they show no response to either cue. Right? But if they have the high risk, they show a very strong response. We can induce neophobia to uh, at least tilapia odor in guppies. So they show a strong response, and that response decreases with subsequent exposures. And on about the fifth exposure, that response appears to be completely absent. For the sixth exposure, however, we're going to give them something different. If this was simply habituating to the lack of uh, information, giving them another novel cue shouldn't really have a huge effect. But if we give them a novel cue, we give them lemon oil, and the response, at least for Scholli index, jumps way up. The response to air use may decline, but clearly it's not significantly different. Not a great test, but it suggests that this is not habituation, that they're actually learning that this cue is no longer risky. All right? So what have we shown? What have we seen? Well, we know that we've shown that neophobia is indeed linked to predation risk. Guppies from the high predation site show a neophobic response, right? And we get consistent responses in the lab and in the field, right? We've shown that it's phenotypically plastic. It's inducible. We can take cichlids, tadpoles, or guppies, expose them to elevated risk, and make them respond to a completely novel chemical cue. We can also, at least with cichlids, we haven't tested it with the other uh, species yet, we can expose them to elevated risk and we can get them to respond to novel visual cues as well. 
So it's not restricted to chemosensory cues. Is it selection or experience? Well, we're not 100% sure. We can't rule out selection because we haven't done the common garden experiments. But I think I've shown you some pretty compelling evidence that background experience, recent experience, does indeed uh, account for neophobic responses. Are some populations more amenable to inducement of neophobia? We don't know yet. Right? We haven't done those large-scale cross-population experiments under constant common garden uh, conditions yet, but that's planned. <clears throat> uh, we know that background level of risk accounts for changes or differences in the response, of the, uh, the response intensity to novel cues, and we know that direct experience uh, and neopho neophobia combine to shape predator recognition mechanisms. Right? So we're taking this at least as a first step for strong support for our model of neophobic predator recognition. Right? And again, neophobia should allow individuals under uncertain variable predation conditions to reduce the initial cost associated with learning, yet still maintain sufficient behavioral flexibility, behavioral plasticity, to deal with variation in predation pressure. The other thing I will point out <clears throat> is uh, it's quite interesting. If you look at the predator recognition literature, many papers will say species X has to learn to recognize. Species Y shows innate or genetically fixed recognition. If you look at something like an Atlantic salmon, there are publications that swear up and down that it's learned. That's us. We've, we've shown that. We've tested that. There are other uh, labs, right? Anne McGurn, uh, Anne McGurn's lab in Scotland, shows what looks like innate recognition to novel predator cues in juvenile Atlantic salmon. So not only do you get species difference in innate versus learned, we have evidence within the species. So what this suggests is that maybe trying to characterize predator recognition as innate versus learned is a gross oversimplification. And really, we should be looking at the role that background predation risk and uncertainty has in shaping the responses. Okay? Now, I'll just leave you very quickly <clears throat> with some idea of what we're doing next. All right? We've been talking about predator recognition. What we want to do is we want to look at the other side of the trade-off. Right? We've been accused publicly at meetings of ignoring foraging costs. Right? Because we always say prey animals adjust these complex anti-predator responses to maintain some foraging benefit. Well, we're actually going to manipulate foraging and ask the question, does increasing foraging competition have an effect on neophobic predator recognition? Does neophobic, inducing neophobic predator recognition have an effect on how prey forage? Right? So we will look at the other side of that trade-off. Uh, when Mo was here in the fall, she talked to you, presumably, about forgetting and retention. How long do individuals uh, retain learned information, why do they retain learned information? We want to look at the retention of neophobic uh, information. Is this a temporal, is this repeated exposures, right? And does it follow the predictions of adaptive forgetting or memory windows? So we'll be looking at that. And the most important question that I'm sure all of you are asking yourself right now is why? Who cares, right? Whoops, I'll tell you about that one later. Why do we care about neophobia? Well, we care because, at least I think, it's a rather interesting behavioral question. But there are very strong applications to uh, uh, wildlife management uh, programs. If you look at the uh, government data on the cost of just pick one species, Atlantic salmon restoration programs in uh, Canada, we're talking tens of millions of dollars each year. Uh, to grow fish, to stock out uh, juvenile salmon, to stock them into natural waterways as part of habitat management and population recovery efforts. If you look at the ecological literature, it suggests that the bulk of these fish that are stocked from hatcheries suffer significantly higher than average predation risk within the first few weeks of stocking. And this is part of what Colin Brown calls the life skills training idea. The idea is that these fish have been exposed to hatchery selection, right? 
they lack the appropriate behavioral phenotypes, and they simply don't recognize what predators are. Right? So can we condition them to recognize predators? Well, there's been some experiments that have done this, and it doesn't seem to work consistently or very well. They simply don't retain it long enough. And what we're doing is we're building this neophobia model, and the idea is can we induce neophobic responses in hatchery reared fish in order to enhance post-stocking survival. Right. So that's the end game. So we get to play with guppies in Trinidad and cichlids in the lab, but ultimately we want to take what we know and apply it to commercially important species such as the Atlantic salmon on the east coast of Canada. And we'll be starting those experiments uh, this summer, so I'll invite you back in a few years and I'll tell you if it works or not. With that, uh, 44 minutes, 42 seconds. Right. That's almost perfect. So let's ruin that by uh, taking a moment uh, to thank the people that actually uh, helped me with all of this. So, uh, Jean-Guy Gaudin, Indar Ramnarayan at the University of the West Indies, uh, Doug Chivers and Moe Ferrari have helped with the development of all these ideas. Chris Elvich has not only helped with the development of all these ideas, but he has tirelessly carried hundreds and hundreds of buckets of water up and down streams uh, and helped with all the data collection. Uh, Camille McNaughton is sitting back there. She has also carried her fair share of buckets uh, in Trinidad as well. Uh, Gemma, Patrick, Chris, Pierre, Brendan, and Ebony are actually the people that did all the work. And uh, these people gave me money. So with that, I'll be happy to take any questions you may have.